It's the same thing with clinical trials. A typical drug, for it to be approved, takes costs over a billion dollars, and it takes 10 to 15 years from conception to approval by the FDA. As you can see, there's drug discovery, then you gotta do some trials, then you do phase one, then you do phase two, phase three, then you get FDA review. It just takes a long time. And there's a lot of bureaucracy and wasted stuff in all that process. And so last year, the government completely, restream, completely streamlined and re, it just took a hard look at the clinical trials that are being done in the US. And as a result, this is one of the big advancements of how we're doing clinical trials in the future. So the way this trial works is imagine this. Imagine you're a researcher. Let's say I'm, my job is I'm a PhD and I'm researching cancer treatments. And I have a new treatment. Well, if it takes 10 to 15 years for that drug to get approved, what happens if five years from now this, we discover something new and the science changes? We gotta start all over. So the nice thing about this is that it's like a plug and play trial matrix. You take squamous cell and you enroll them on a trial. And if the science changes, the agents change. So for right now, this is this master lung cancer protocol. Right now, they're testing P13 kinase inhibitors, CD4, CD6 inhibitors, fibroblast growth factor receptors, and HGF inhibitors. But let's say a trial comes out next year that says P13 kinase inhibitors stink. They don't work for lung cancer. Then they get rid of this arm, and let's say they have new data that comes out in nature that says this pathway, the, 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 the zebra pathway, is the pathway that's the most important one for lung cancer. Then they just plug it into this path, into this protocol. The patients are there, and so it's streamlined. So instead of instead of a drug company making a protocol for this agent, and then another drug company making a protocol for a different agent in the same class, and if it doesn't work, then they got to scrap it and start all over. Instead, you've got a set of patients, and depending on the latest and greatest science, they're plugged into different groups. And if you don't have, these are all driver mutations. If you don't have a driver mutation, you get, you get randomized into an immune stimulating drug. So everybody's getting something cool. You're either gonna get, if you don't have a target, if you don't have a driver mutation, then you get randomized to the group that's going to do some sort of immune stimulation to try to help your body fight off the cancer. I think it's a real exciting future of trials and future for lung cancer. And that is it. And I left 10 minutes to listen and answer questions. Yes, ma'am. Are any, there any nutrition, any type of nutrition that would improve your immunity? Maybe yeah. prevent? Great, great question. The question was, what about nutrition in the immune system? Great question. It's not surprising if, you, if you're a college student and you don't get any sleep, you're going to get sick a lot. Or if you're stressed out because a loved one is sick or a loved one passed away, you get sick. So clearly things like sleep, how, what your stress level is, how your appetite is, what you're eating plays a role in your ability to fight off things. So great question. I don't know of a magic formula, but I do think in the U.S. right now there's a very strong farm-to-table movement. Instead of having things preserved in packages, it's a movement to get it quickly from the farm to the table. And I think that's a great move. Um, I think um, anything someone can do in the middle of treatment to minimize the stress is good. There's, there are oncology practices in the U.S. that have installed gyms where they get chemo to try to keep people busy and try to get their stress level down. I have um, always been a very strong uh, proponent for regular exercise for my patients who are in the midst of chemo or finish chemo because I think it's just a good stress reliever if they can do it. And there's data in breast cancer 
that perhaps regular exercise prevents breast cancer recurrence? And a lot of those sort of questions are still being answered. A good question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are most cancers, uh, lung cancers, discovered in stage four, or what is the percentage that? That's a very good question. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think I think I can answer your question. Sometimes cancers are found incidentally. Many times cancers are found in stage three or stage four, where there's not as many things you can do. In the U.S. right now, uh, and the HSA hospitals are very strong proponent of this. So here at Chippenham and Johnson Willis is this lung cancer screening. So with using a CT scan that has less radiation, there is active efforts to do CT scans to help catch a lung cancer earlier. Now, you can't do that to the whole population, it just doesn't make sense. So basically, the basic tenets of this lung cancer screening CT scan is that you have to identify those individuals that are the highest risk of developing lung cancer, and then screen those individuals with CT scans. You know, are we in that group? Yes. Are, see, yes. Right. I mean, individuals who, so talk to your primary care physician, and if you're interested in getting, uh, talk to them about this, the ongoing um, CT scan for lung cancer screening. It's a great, great, yeah, it's a great point, Russell. That's, you guys are unfortunately in that group, so talk to your primary care physician. Yes? But how, how often would you get that? Because, I mean, just... It depends on the results of the CT scan. <laughs> but, I mean, let's say in the CT scan you were clear. Um, it, so would you get it the next year, or...? There, there, there are guidelines that are changing, and they use criteria based on what they find on the CT scan. It's like if you go and get your colonoscopy and you have a clear colonoscopy, it's 10 years. If not, you come back in three years sort of thing, or back in a year. It's the same sort of idea. There are some set guidelines that are followed. Because I'm on the other end of this um, continuum of cancer diagnosis and treatment, you know, it's, it's not something that at Virginia Cancer Institute that we participate in, although we have talked to some of the primary care physicians in town about trying to partner together because we have a CT scanner in the West End and we try, always are trying to figure out how can we use that to benefit our patients, that perhaps with some primary care physicians we can use these guidelines and try to make it easier because, for example, we can get scans and Saturday, and some insurances, if you haven't noticed already, if you get a scan in the hospital, or if you get a colonoscopy in the hospital, it's substantially more expensive than if you get it in the outpatient setting. Well, I was curious because um, my husband died from lung cancer at 46, and he had had an x-ray, and I know they say x-rays don't show. Yes, ma'am. Usually. But he had had it one year, had not had it the next year, and then had it the next year. And by that time, he had it showed up on the X-ray, and it was five centimeters, non-small cell. Yes, ma'am. So that's why I was curious. Yeah, the, you know. the data. There's been several trials of looking at chest X-rays for screening of lung cancer, and what you just mentioned is the problem with that: is that it's not sensitive enough, and that's where this low radiation CT scan, so quicker scan. Don't worry, people aren't worried about you know the rate, the cumulative lifetime radiation exposure. Right. Um, but if you look at the trial data, which it came out showing there was benefit, you have to do a lot of scans to find a, a lung cancer. So that's the issue. So that's why they're trying to, to, um, to make sure that they're, if you're going to do the <coughs> screening, you're going to do it in the highest risk patients. So those patients who have a smoking history and have underlying lung damage, for example. Thank you. Your neighbor to the left. Yes. Um, my sister and I both have decided we will get lung cancer. Everybody in our family has died with lung cancer. 
What is a preventative? I don't have it. You need to talk to your primary care physician and get this, do the screening. That's what you need to do. And then you're obviously not smoking now, right? No. You know, the thing that I would encourage you to do, and this is what I encourage a lot of patients, is for it sort of follow up to the lady's question in the back is, get as healthy as you can. Minimize your stress, minimize your stress, eat well, you know, um, try to get regular exercise the best you can. I know that's a struggle sometimes. Um, you know, a couple of things to mention, uh, places that I've sent patients to. <coughs> yeah, rehab is great. Also, um, the YMCA has for cancer patients, and I don't know how much they have for non-cancer patients, but they have a grant from the Live Strong Foundation. So if you have any family members who are who had cancer, they have a grant where at several locations in the Richmond area where they are allowed to have regular exercise with personal trainers at a very minimal cost for cancer survivors. And then there are various health clubs in town, including, for example, what I think of as ACAC. They have a physician-referred exercise program. So those individuals who, who aren't a candidate for something like Russell and, and the groups here are doing with rehab, <coughs> ACAC has a physician-referred exercise program. It's $60 for 60 days. You get your foot in the door of starting. Sometimes it's a lifestyle change. You've you got to get in, just start the exercise. And the nice thing about a lot of these health clubs is that they do have some low impact options such as water aerobics and so forth for people who have significant arthritis complaints. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What foods your immune system? Great question. So any of the antioxidants are great. So for the immune system, I think it is like the days of the health class. It is balance, but it's also making sure you get a good amount of your daily nutrition from fresh fruits and vegetables. We in the U.S. have more colon cancer than folks do in Eastern countries because we eat more red meat processed food that slow down that passage of food through our GI tract making it more likely for us to have colon cancer. So less on the fried stuff, less full, you know, less on high percentage of our da daily calories from meat more into fruits and vegetables is the healthy.